the story of Julius Rosenwald. Rosenwald, the guiding light of Sears Roebuck and Company, the largest mail-order firm in the world, was born on August 12, 1862, in Springfield, Illinois. From boyhood on, Rosenwald gave evidence of unusual initiative. He obtained a job clerking in a small store, working hard, scrimping on expense money until he managed to save $20. We find the youthful Rosenwald talking with a friend in the store. Will that be all today, Johnny? Yeah, I guess so, Julius. <laughs> you know, as long as I've been coming to this store, I've never found any other price on your merchandise than, than 49 and 99 cents. Sure, those are the only prices we have. Well, why not 50 cents and a dollar instead of 49 and 99? It'd <laughs> be much simpler, wouldn't it? Maybe simpler, but not just good business. Perhaps our customers can get the same merchandise at other stores for 50 cents and a dollar, but they come here... Oh, and... yeah, and save a penny. <laughs> uh-huh, sounds like they're saving more. Good psychology, Johnny. Else, why do you come here? Well, well, because you're a penny cheaper, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you're certainly learning salesmanship, Julius. Uh, was this penny save an idea of yours? Yep, that's right. Mm, your boss is mighty lucky to have you. I'm lucky to have the job. I've managed to save $20 this summer. Well, considering your salary, that's a miracle. <laughs> what are you going to do with it? I invested all of it in this. Uh, on that big box, you mean? <laughs> no, and what's in it? A kind of tea set for my mother. It's her 20th wedding anniversary today. Say, yes, she'll be crazy about that. Oh, here she comes now. Good morning, Julia. Hello, Mama. Good morning, Johnny. Good yeah, morning, Miss Rosenwald. Oh, oh, Mrs. Rosenwald, and what can I do for you this morning? <laughs> Listen to him, Johnny. Treating me like a regular customer. <laughs> I want a spool of white thread. Well, <laughs> now, madam, you know we have nothing under 49 cents. Oh. But I tell you what I'll do. Instead of the thread, I'll give you this big package. Julius, what is this? Open it. What? What on earth can it... Oh, this is a tea set. For your wedding anniversary, Mom. Oh, my dear boy. You take all the money you've saved to surprise me. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear. But, Julius, I have a surprise for you, too. For me, Mom? You know your Uncle Jacob in New York in the wholesale clothing business? Yes. He wants that you should come there. He has a job for you. A job? In New York? Oh, Molly, you hear that, Johnny? A job in New York. <laughs> New York sure is a big place, though. Yes, and you're so young to leave home, Julia. Then I'll take home with me, Molly. You and Papa shall go to New York, too. I want to start out young because I'm going to have a lot to do in business before I'm through. <laughs> Julius Rosenwald followed his work through with action, and by the time he was 23, had saved enough money from his work in New York to start a manufacturing clothing business of his own in Chicago. The firm did well, and one of its most important customers was Richard W. Sears, head of a mail-order house operating in Chicago. In Richard Sears, he sees an opportunity to profit from this learning and approaches Sears. How did you start in the mail-order business, Mr. Sears? Well, in a sort of a roundabout way, Julius. While I was a station agent in Minnesota, I uh, decided I could make some extra money by selling watches by mail. Oh. Well, I wrote letters and sent messages over the wires to all my friends who I thought might be interested. Mm hmm So many of them were that I got enough capital to advertise. Well, business boomed, and when I was 25, I had an offer of $125,000 for my business. So I sold it with the understanding that I wouldn't sell watches for three years under my own name. Oh, then that's why you formed the new firm under the name of A.C. Roebuck and Company. Yes, but Roebuck isn't my partner and never has been. He was an employee. We used his name, and when the three years were up, I added my name to the Roebuck, which had been extensively advertised, and it remains the same today. Mr. Sears, I want to buy into your business. You? My brother-in-law and I have studied Sears and Roebuck from all angles. You've come to the stage now where you must expand. Yes, I know. We have more business now than our capital can swing. What's the value you place on your business? $140,000. All right, then. Sell a two-third partnership to my brother-in-law and myself for 70000 and we'll more than meet the demands of your customers. A two-third partnership? 
All right, Julius. If you can pay me $70,000, you're both in. Sears Roebuck not only needs new capital, it needs new blood, fighting blood, to meet the new problems of competitive business. You'll never regret this decision, Mr. Sears. We'll make Sears Roebuck the biggest mail-order house in the world. The new capital enabled Sears and Roebuck to expand, and Sears made Rosenwald vice president of the firm in 1896, a year after he had come in. Julius immediately rejuvenated the business. He was a human dynamo from whose desk ran the wires of progress that were felt throughout the entire organization. We find him with Sears and several department heads discussing a Sears and Roebuck catalog. I've been comparing this catalog with the ones put out by our competitors, Mr. Sears. And while our company isn't nearly as bad as the others, we've got to be careful about the wording of our advertisements. When we say a thing is so, or show a picture to that effect, the merchandise has to match up with our words. Oh, well, I've tried to do that in the past, Julius. I know you have, Mr. Sears. The manufacturers are more to blame than you, but I've got a plan to stop that. Sears Roebuck will sell merchandise on a money-back guarantee. Well, right. A money-back guarantee? Well, 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 yes, well, well, Julius, well, that'll ruin us. No, it won't. It'll raise the standards of merchandising like nothing else could. But, uh, Now, look. Give me a chance to prove my plan, Mr. Sears. I want to make over this entire catalogue. I've called you artists and copy men in here to tell you to picture our merchandise exactly as it looks to you. I'm going to hire more buyers, increase our mailing list, and enlarge this catalog so that it'll include almost everything a human being could want, from saddles to soup strainers. I expect someday this catalog output to cost millions annually. Incidentally, if the market values go down after the catalog is issued... The difference in price will be refunded to our customers. Well, you'll revolutionize the mail order business, Julius. That's just what I want to do. I want to prove to people that we believe honesty is the best policy. That they can send their money along with their order with the absolute assurance that they're going to get exactly what they ordered. I want interpreters hired so that customers can feel free to, to order from every part of the world in any language. This is going to be a world organization, Mr. Sears. I thought I had a mail order business. <laughs> Julius, you make me look like an amateur. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll make money all right, Mr. Sears. But this business is going to help our employees as well as ourselves. You mean uh, because we'll give work to thousands? We'll give them work and more. I'm going to inaugurate a system of saving and profit sharing, by which at the end of each year, an employee will get back $2 for every one. That opportunity will, of course, be optional. But it'll make everyone who works for us a partner, sharing in our profits. Rosenwald did not only give its employees a share of the profits, but athletic fields, recreation grounds and gardens all surrounding the main plant in Chicago. The organization moved swiftly forward, their catalogs reaching every part of the civilized world and costing annually almost $10 million. Then, one day in 1916, Julius Rosenwald was called to Washington, called to the White House to find himself with the nation's chief executive, Woodrow Wilson. Mr. Rosenwald, I've been studying the careers of America's most successful businessmen, and by careful elimination, have decided that you are the man I need for the particular job I have in mind. I'm greatly honored, Mr. President. This job has to do with war. We need someone to buy supplies for our army and navy. Well, well, I... What can I say, sir, except that I shall do my best? I know you will. Oh, it's all a nasty business, this. But so long as we're going to be in it, we want to back up those boys who are fighting for us to the fullest extent. I'm going to appoint you a member of the Advisory Commission of the Council of National Defense and Chairman of the Committee of Supply. Mr. President, will you understand me when I say that I'm sorry that you find it necessary to appoint anyone to such a position? I understand, Mr. Rosenwald. But I feel that I have picked the right man for this colossal task. Believe me, too, when I say that no one regrets the necessity of this more than I. In 1918, Julius Rosenwald went to France for the Secretary of War on a special commission. In 1919, he was a member of the Second Industrial Conference. Then, with war over, he returned to his business and became an active worker in many civic, philosophical, and educational bodies. And one day, several of his employees came to his office with a scroll of paper. Well, Billy, yes, man? What can I do for you today? Well, I have something to read to you, Mr. Rosenwald. Hmm, looks like a petition. 
Well, Billings, if it's trouble of some sort, better get to it as quickly as possible so we can iron it out that much quicker. Well, listen carefully, Mr. Rosenwald. Inasmuch as we, the employees of Sears, Roebuck, and Company, find you, Julius Rosenwald, responsible for the following philanthropies, to wit, $250,000 to the University of Chicago, $250,000 for the Westside Jewish Charity Home, $50,000 for the Social Workers Country Club, $25,000 in Tuskegee Institute offshoots, including rural schools for Negro children. Now, hold on there, baby. Oh, I haven't finished yet, Mr. Rosenwald. $25,000 to a colored YMCA building in every community in America, which, within five years, could raise an additional $75,000 by public subscription. There were more than a dozen cities that qualified. And your $1 million contribution to the American Jewish Relief Committee in 1917. And your loyal support of every worthwhile cause and endeavor in the country. You have spent your fortune unselfishly, Mr. Rosenwald. For this... My fellow employees, thank you, and wish to present you with this medal as a token of their esteem. Hmm. <laughs> well, I don't know just what brought this all up, Billings, but all I have to say is Robert Ingersoll's famous remark. I'd rather be a beggar and spend my money like a king than be a king and spend my money like a beggar. <laughs> Such was the life of this great man, humanitarian by nature, courageous adventurer in untried fields of commerce, man of integrity, brilliance, and achievement, Julius Rosenwald, Captain of Industry. <laughs> <laughs>